Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, I think we were told that uh, the speakers have about four minutes to, to wrap up what they want to say. Uh, presumably what they have in mind for 40 minutes squeezed into four minutes is actually amazing. All right, but because of time factor, so I will not need to introduce every one of you or every one of them. We will start straight to the speaker. Uh, their bio data is with all of you. Um, the, the topic that we have been uh, they asked to, to talk about today is about uh, the economic outlook in the various sectors that has been mentioned. And looking at what is happening today, uh, the resilient economic performance risks that are, we are facing in Malaysia uh, is, is projected to be tilted downwards, uh, although uh, the minister has just left that uh, politically we always say that it's good, all right? Uh, there are uncertainty in the global economic environment, including rising trade conflicts, mortality in global financial markets and prices, geopolitical, and so on. Uh, I think these are facts that we all know, and without much ado, I would like to go straight to the first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Dr. Ian Hefji Muhammad Abdul Kasim, to talk about the oil and gas sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. I think time given to uh, me is very, very short. So I would just uh, go straight, uh, precise, short, and uh, brief. My take is this. For the outlook for oil and gas uh, industry for 2019, though everybody is uh, saying that it is very volatile year, I would like to uh, put my bet that in the oil and gas industry, it will maintain bullish and it will maintain uh, sustainable uh, moving forward. My reasons is this. Number one, if you look at uh, the oil price, of course it has been uh, fluctuating uh, recently uh, between 55 to, seven, uh, to, to 65, 65 to 75, and it goes down again. But not that, whatever it is, way back about five years ago, uh, everybody realized that all the asset owner, which is referring to, for example, like our country, Malaysia, Petronas, uh, Shell, Exomobil, and so on, they have undergone a rationalization uh, process. What it means here is they have looked into the costing uh, to derive or produce per barrel uh, uh, oil. So with this uh, process of rationalization, they have more or less uh, come to a conclusion that they have reduced down the cost of producing per barrel. And as the price uh, goes up after that, and uh, the rationalization practice of the costing still maintain. Eh? So meaning to say that at the price that it is at the moment, there is still a very big gap of profitability. Number two, uh, my bet and my guess on this uh, bullish and sustainable outlook is based on the uh, fact that all these asset owners are undergoing uh, technology, latest state-of-art approach of producing uh, the oil, which a lot of them is engaging into Industry Revolution 4.0 uh, technology, and that helps in terms of improving the efficiency and at the end game is increase the productivity. Less shutdown uh, of all those uh, unnecessary um, upset in the equipment. And number three uh, is uh, though there are a lot of efforts that have been put forward for renewable energy as an option to compare to the fossil uh, source of energy, it is still at the process I would say that certain uh, options are still struggling and uh, in terms of competitiveness compared to the fossil technology, it is still yet to be Decided. Yeah. For example, like uh, Tesla recently, they have announced a huge retrenchment because uh, they, they see that uh, the cost of producing EV is on the high side. So I maintain as it is and uh, look forward for the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I, I, I guess please be ready with your questions uh, uh, later for that though. Now I'd like to proceed to Dr. Henry. Yes, Dr. Please. Okay, thanks, Professor. My name is Henry, of course, from Microcures. Uh, I think I got the opportunity to share a sector 
e-commerce, which is, I think, probably the easiest one to share so far. Um, just to share a little bit more of the dry stuff on the e-commerce side. Um, in 2018, e-commerce in Malaysia is about 3.1 billion US dollars. Uh, that's about 1% of our country's GDP. Um, basically, this year, 2019, is projected to grow to about 3.9 billion US dollars, um, which is more than 20% of uh, what was projected um, previously. So last year or the two years ago, they projected that in 2019 or 2020, we'll grow at a rate of about 20% per year. But uh, so far, they have grown more than 20%, and 2019, it looks like it's going to be over 20% again, so it's about 24% to about 3.9 billion US dollars. And you look at it, is that with our economy growing at only about 4 to 5%, uh, e-commerce is growing four to five times, or even more of that uh, growth of our country's GDP. So um, in terms of that area, um, e-commerce is growing really, really strongly. Um, and I think this is going to be the next future trend in that area. Uh, just to share a little bit more statistics, uh, if you look at it, while it's only generating about 1% to 1.5% of our country's GDP, uh, over 60% of Malaysians have bought something online, uh, have also um, involved themselves in e-commerce. So if you look at it in the sense that why there's a big disparity between 60% of Malaysians having access or buy something online to... Um, the GDP is only about 1% to 1.5%. I think the, the, the key here is that it shows that there are still a lot of abundance of opportunity um, where there are a lot more services that we can provide to this group of people that probably do not need education anymore. I mean, we used to have a problem of educating uh, uh, consumers how to buy something online or to consume services online, but I think that is not really much needed anymore. We have a big, huge 60% market, so it's something that we can continue to leverage and only, to be honest, despite having 60% and in that environment, there's only about 160 US dollars. 160 US dollars are spent um, on e-commerce averagely by every Malaysian. So there's still a very, very small amount. So there's abundance of growth in that area. Um, but if you look at it, despite all this growth, um, there is no, I should say there could be some, but there's actually no cannibalization in the sense that uh, as you can see, the retails uh, the, uh, are still growing strong. You see our shopping malls are still filled with people, uh, which is good. But yet the e-commerce is also growing. So it shows that they are not actually cannibalization, but they are actually new growth um, or new sector of the economy being built through e-commerce. Um, having said that, it's also because that I think um, what I see um, from uh, e-commerce perspective is that uh, it gives a new opportunity to on an equal opportunity to many companies. Uh, we know we used to have big companies dominating many industries, and um, this new platform called e-commerce gives that opportunity to many of these companies to create an equal level playing ground. And of course, to sell things beyond Malaysian shores with our digital future zones and what's not, that's also very important. Um, and I think um, the outlook for this sector is really needless to say. I think all the statistics is one thing. But rather, generally saying is that um, we in Malaysia itself, we have the things like DF, DZ is really ready. Um, we have a very, very supportive uh, MCMC, of course, our communication minister, which is pushing really hard in terms of coverage and giving us top quality broadband services. Uh, I think this will encourage the sector to grow really fast. So I think that if any companies would like to go into this area, it's a abundant opportunity. But also do make, ensure that E-commerce is not really just about selling something online. It's also about digitalizing your products, digitalizing your services, or even digitalizing your physical retail store to make sure it's accessible to the digital economy. People like all of us here, which has access to a mobile device or not. So, yeah, it's a good outlook, I would say, but any Q&A is, uh, yeah, we can reserve it after this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Henry. Uh, next, I think we would like to hear from uh, Dr. Michael Kang, a good friend of mine. I told him that if we don't meet, we don't meet for years, but recently we have been meeting each other. Uh, he texted me before three hours, two hours ago and said, what am I supposed to say? I say I'm a moderator, I'm not a speaker. So let's hear from Dr. Michael Kang on what's the outlook of SMEs and they are actually the foundation for the growth of this country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay, I think uh, 
Uh, I just heard that today's uh, seminars from the mornings until now, I think most of the speakers uh, predict uh, 2019 will be a bad, very bad, especially for the SMEs. Uh, I think uh, since 2018, the new government is taking over, SMEs are still uh, facing a lot of problems as the governments, we're, we're talking about a lot of policies or direct, directions for the SME uh, are known. This is why you can see uh, during the transition period, we talk about the new government, uh, the government ruling before they come out, the, the master plans of the, for the SMEs. I think the transition period, they are missing links. There's a missing link for SME. That's why you can see the, for the 2018 until today, uh, most of the SME facing problems uh, were increase the cost of doing business. Uh, especially when it comes to the human, human uh, capitals, uh, human resource, uh, they're facing the problems of getting the labors uh, to start up for, uh, to, to capture their orders. Those who SME doing uh, export are doing very well in 2018 and in, even in 2019. I think they foresee this a very good business for the SME who are uh, doing export business. As the, I think the minister has mentioned that very clear, the ASEAN is a huge market for us. And also the US and the China war uh, really help a lot of SME. Uh, those who are doing export, the uh, sales have been increased, but the, the problem they face is on the labors. They can't get enough manpower to produce, uh, to, to cook up for their production lines. A lot of SMEs move their pro production lines overseas or pass the orders to the regional uh, countries. This is the big problem. So we urge the new government should, before the the policies of the human resource come out, they should have a transition policy to assist SME to overcome uh, their problem. So this is the, 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 the important uh, message. We hope that the government can come out uh, a transition period to assist the SME. As you can know that for the past uh, four years, SME growth is very marginal. GDP contribution is only 0.3%. We are looking at when I meet up with Mr. Entrepreneur, he told me, by 2020, we need to meet 41%, but we only uh, hit, for, the, uh, for 2017, we only hit 37.1%. So every year, we only grow 0.3%, 36.3, 36.6, 37.1. So to hit 41 by 2020, we have only two years left. So how to make it happen? It's SME should be very important for the country economy uh, development. So we hope the government can come up uh, better policies to assist SME growth for the next two years to hit 41%. It's not easy for to grow within two years. 4% uh, growth or 5% growth uh, for the SME is not very tough. As you can see, the cost of doing business for SMEs is increased tremendously for the last few months. Uh, this, uh, you can see our uh, electrical, electricity price increase, our labor cost increase, minimum wage is increased. We, the government are not talking about productivity. Government using, there is no transition, increase all the cost of labor, uh, cost of doing business. But yes, the, when we are talking about transition to the industry 4.0, Malaysia SME, when I always say Malaysia, not even 1% of SME are able to embark into the industry 4.0 for the next two years. It's not, it's not easy for SME to move in. So I hope that the government really can seriously look into it to help the SME in the transition period to move into the industry 4.0 before that, there is some strategy to help the SME. If I foresee the way the same policy, with current policy to go without any new system on SME, a lot of traditional, traditional business SME will close down for the next few years. Because uh, when I talk to most of the SME, they told me they are just waiting to, to close down until if you don't have any good assistance, 
because the cost of doing business are keep on increasing, they keep on passing down the cost to the consumer. You can see all the, even include today, you go to McDonald's, a simple meal, 20 ringgit. Even yesterday, I was uh, at Sunway, you know, I, I have ordered the, the McDonald's, you know, three, three person meal cost me 70 ringgit. So I think it's very high now, you know, just simple a, a, a burger. Previously, very cheap. So everything are passing down to the consumer now because government are not discussing and they are not meeting, discuss, listen to the industry. They are not dialogue with the industry. They are, we hope that the government can open their mind, open their ear to sit down with the industry. How government can work together with the industry to build our country economy. This is New Malaysia. We hope that the industry can grow to grow the economy. We, we, are, we are looking at a holistic economy policy. How to grow SME as the SME is the uh, is a country for, for engine of the countries as SME contributes sixty five point six percent of workforce. So all the peoples in Malaysia, one third of Malaysians are employed by the SME. So to improve the B40, to improve the, our Malaysian uh, people's income, I think is you have, government have to focus on economy development. If we build out our economy, if we can have a very good economy policy to help the, all the SME uh, create the wealth, I think all the raya will benefit out from here because they can earn more salary, can earn more income, so that everybody can have a good, uh, I think, income, so that this is what the government should look seriously into. It's not, uh, they don't have any policy, but they go for the very minor, minor uh, policy. They are setting it out, like, increase the minimum, but it's not productivity link. You know, they increase uh, this uh, electricity bill, but they don't look into it. How to help the SME into the automation? You know, all these are we are looking. We hope that we can seriously sit down and discuss and make it happen. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Michael Kang. Uh, now we, we we heard just now about e-commerce compared to traditional retail, uh, and I think Dr. Sri Gary, also my good friend, uh, who is actually the president of MRCA, uh, I guess he should share share with us his concerns about the retail. Uh, Dr. Sri, please. Uh, let's look at the dynamics of uh, retail. Basically, I would like to give you an overall picture about the retail uh, growth for since 2015. 2015, we have more than 4% retail growth. And 2016, is below 4%. And 2017 was only about 2% or so. Last year, we are projected to have about 4.8%. 4, 4 and this year, we projected uh, to have 4.9% 4, 4 or so, plus minus 5%, in tandem with the GDP growth. You see, looking at the retail, it seems rather sluggish. It's not moving uh, as, as what we projected. Eh? I rather, I personally wish that the retail will move at uh, at least a double-digit 10% growth. And this is easily achievable. Actually, if let's say, uh, I'm a strong proponent about tourism. Eh? You see, tourism is one sector that you give it immediate uh, multiply effect to the economy. Eh? You don't have to wait for FDIs. It takes maybe take years and months. And this has very telling effects, especially on retail. You see, when the tourists were to come into a country, uh, you can see they spend more than 30% on shopping alone. You look at uh, Thailand today. Thailand is, Bangkok is the most surprising. Today is the world most visited city in the world. You see? And second come to London, Paris, Dubai, Singapore, and then six is New York. Uh, looking at this, uh, you see, new, uh, even Bangkok alone uh, attracted uh, 10 million uh, Chinese tourists alone. And they have about 3 million uh, medical uh, uh, tourists went to Thailand, which actually we could easily have offered all this. Eh? And looking at tourism again, by 2030, it's going to be the number one contributor in the world economy in GDP. So we can't overlook this. Eh? And last year, there was a 6% growth to about 1.4 billion tourists. And China makes up more than 10% of it. They have about 150 million or so uh, China tourists traveling. 
and they spend almost uh, 280 billion USD. Can you imagine? It's so much more, almost double our foreign reserve, you see. So this is one area the government should not overlook. Should, we should spend more efforts uh, and budget in, to focus into tourism. I think that will be an immediate impact to, for the GDP growth and also overall uh, to spur the, the economy. You see. And of course, a lot of uh, concern about also the, uh, the shopping mall. There's a big glut, you see. Currently, uh, they're talking about Klang Valley, about 87% occupancy. By year 2020, we projected to have 700 malls with about 170 million square foot of letable space. And can you imagine, if let's say not, there's nothing uh, been done about this area, there'll be a big glut, you see. But in Thailand, surprisingly, you don't talk about uh, glut in shopping malls or what, you see. There's always, uh, it's all, most of the time full. You can look at the uh, latest, I was told, Icon, I'm supposed to go there and have a look. They even have uh, very interactive malls, you know? well, probably the biggest. You even have the, uh, the boat, you know, the, the Sunday market boat inside the shopping mall itself. Can you imagine? They're bringing action into the mall. And these are the future. And, and looking at China as well, you see, uh, Alibaba has started the robot shops, and more than 100 of it now. Uh, it's the dynamics of uh, retail has uh, moved very fast. And looking even at China versus US, today the Chinese use about 98% of the smartphone, you see. Uh, and U.S. is only 40%. You can see that U.S. actually is actually behind China by two years. Very soon, uh, and China, in fact, also have taken over U.S., probably the number one retailer in the world today. Uh, looking at the dynamics of it, and it's going so fast. So people in the retail industry, we have to be very fully aware. Those who are uh, mortar, break and mortar, like people like us, uh, who have shops, restaurants, and all this, we also have to look into online. You see, for example, uh, uh, even many of our members are going online now, including Padini, Focus, you know, and many others. In China, you look at the, the landscape. Alibaba is moving to brick and mortar, and also JD.com. YC versa in US, Walmart almost the biggest uh, hypermarket in the world, almost went bankrupt. But fortunately, they have aggressive enough to buy, uh, they bought the, uh, Jet.com, and they've turned around the business now. Huh? So they have online and offline business to balance out the, the business in terms of turnover, the spread. And that's what people want, you see. Uh, so now we have to be very, very uh, focused on this area, especially on the uh, you know, uh, e-commerce side. And it's moving so fast. And uh, mind you, about 70% or so of the youth are using online, uh, unlike uh, people like us who don't use so much. But the youth, every little thing is all over the smartphone. Uh, they'll be scrolling uh, what is the best price and what is the best product, the latest, and all this. So we also have to be very mindful about what is happening uh, on this retail area. And uh, retail, one of the very exciting areas about retail is that uh, it's on F&B. You look at retail, wellness and, uh, what you call it, wellness and health products are always uh, double-digit growth. Uh, it is always positive. But the fashion and some others uh, uh, is actually sluggish. But for F&B, it's also in a very dynamic and growing area. Uh, it's very interesting to see that even a lot of the malls like in Singapore, they're increasing their occupancy of the letable space up to 30 to 40 percent. Those days, we thought about 15, 20 percent, you know. And in Hong Kong, uh, it's about perhaps about 23 percent. In Europe, it's only about 15 percent. You see the dynamics of the, the what you call it, the tendency mix, you know, the business mix is so different from uh, Europe to Asia. You know? So this will be changing as well. So uh, retailers, especially on F&B, we have to be very mindful. Eh? And those who are on F&B, for example, especially on F&B, the first year, I can tell you, 30% of the shops were closed. Many of them well, they can't survive even for the first year. It's because the competition is so great. New concepts and uh, you know, pricing, locations, uh, and so many other factors. And now we also have labor problem. Of course, we can't give good service. Eh? And uh, this is some, something we have to look about. And within the next three years, probably the balance of, six of the retailer, 60% may not survive due to high tendency, uh, I mean, in terms of high rental rates, high labor costs. So we have to be very uh, savvy and very cost conscious and very forward-looking in our marketing plans. Eh? 
our ten, uh, our product mix, yeah, the way we market our products. Of course, in the F and B or retail location is always very very important. Even in KLCC, you can see that some of the top brands, uh, when once they move into another location, suddenly it become dead, is it? So we have to be very careful. Even like uh, example is was British India. He was at the concourse here. He was doing so well. So of course, when he was he was supposed to move to another area, of course the landlord, I mean the 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 owner refused, eh? Because knowing that if we move to another place, it could be a dead sentence, eh? And with the rental, you can't survive. So location and many other factors. So you have to be very very uh, uh, tiptoe and very alert on on all these areas, eh? Um, so this is uh, just a brief on uh, retail, and uh, hopefully, I mean, should you have any question, you can uh, may ask later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sri. Uh, now we will move on to, uh, in line with what he says about the need for tourism to actually sp spur hit the retail industry. Oh, sorry, I've forgotten. It's Siwa first, right? So we're going to the property market. <laughs> All right, Siwa first. Thank right. you. Well, as far as the property market is concerned, I think... Um, not much good news. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of bad press, uh, negative press in the papers lately about uh, 39,000 units of unsold um, condominiums and residential units that are floating about. Uh, a lot of them are in uh, KL, Penang and JB. The property market has been on a bit of a downturn since 2012, uh, right through to 2015 and 16 and 17 where not just volume, volume of transactions, but also the total value of, uh, of uh, transactions have fallen. Uh, if you compare 2018, uh, we all thought that maybe 2018 there would be a slight um, a rebound because the first quarter of 2018 registered a 4.3% growth. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't carry through to the second quarter because in the second quarter, the market contracted by negative 2.4 percent so you know it's like a it's a, it's a bit of a yo-yo thing um, so unfortunately if um, we don't have figures for fourth quarter yet we only have figures for first second and third and uh, if you compare the three quarters of this year with three quarters of last year we are already in negative territory my um, my guess is that by the time we get the the results for the fourth quarter uh, we will be in net negative territory, which means that the market would have come down for another additional year. One of the main reasons this happens, and uh, unfortunately, nobody seems to want to uh, accept it, take, take notice, is that we are too residential focused. 63% uh, of properties transacted last year is residential in nature. 63% as opposed to industrial, which was only 2%. If only we varied that a little bit, focused a bit more on the industrial, brought the FDIs in, brought the manufacturers in, started building stuff, created a logistics hub here in, 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 in Malaysia, then I think that trickle-up effect would, uh, make, uh, would, would benefit the property market and we would see some positive things happening. Uh, the budget, which was expected to be... Um, <clears throat> Good news um, wasn't really very much good news. It had some snippets of little goodies here and there. But in my opinion, nothing to make uh, a, a, a serious change. Nothing. It won't even dent what's happening here now. Um, and so one of the things is um, the, the question that everybody asks is, are we in for a bad time? I know it looks bad. I know the market looks like it's in a terrible tailspin. But I don't think that it's going to be all doom and gloom. Sure, some developers will be suffering because they have gone and built way too much of things that nobody neither wants nor needs. Right? So those people who are holding stocks uh, will have to go through hard times. Um, the, Penang, uh, the Penang developers are saying that 2019 is expected to be worse than 1997. Uh, but I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think some people will be caught uh, because they have built too much. Uh, but we need to try and do... We need to try and reduce our reliance on residential. We need to try and offer different asset classes for people to invest in. Uh, we also need to try and change the way... Uh, 
um, we 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 give out housing loans because virtually 50 over slightly more than 50 percent of everyone who applies for a housing loan gets rejected for one reason or the other 50 over percent which means in order to sell 10 houses you have to sell that 20 times and then 10 people get rejected uh, so that's really bad for the market so we need to try and think of alternative ways to create uh, uh, funding for 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 home buyers right we need to rethink um, the reliance on residential we we need to start accepting that uh, Kuala Lumpur and, its, and, and Penang and Johor Bahru and its satellite suburbs are way too expensive and the average person can't afford it anymore. So we need to tune our minds to start going further and buy properties which are further away. And those properties which are further away must be attractively priced and must come with services and amenities. Right? But I personally, I think it's a, it's a bit of a cycle. We are on the down cycle now for sure. But I think 2019 will flatten out and I think we will start seeing positive territory in 2020 and 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Shankar, you heard the bell. Very good. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> now I'd like to go to Ganesh, please. I think Ganesh is uh, the chairman of PICOM. I guess uh, that's the most uh, talk about topic about IT. Yeah. Ganesh, please. Sure. Um, Google and Tamasit does a yearly report uh, on the digital economy. Uh, last year's report actually estimated that the digital economy in Southeast Asia will actually grow from 30 billion to 50 billion this year. Um, it, sorry, from, from 20, 2015 to 2017, it expected it will grow from 30 billion to 50 billion. This year, they did a report, and this year, it actually, it actually found out that the digital economy actually grew from 30 billion to 72 billion in that two years. So more than doubling from 2015 to 2017. In the same 2017 report, it was forecasted that by 2025, the whole digital economy would be worth $200 billion. Right? In other words, multiplying four times over seven years, and in compounded increase of 70% a year. Now, in the current report, they've actually forecasted that the digital economy will hit 240 billion instead of 200 billion, right? In other words, accelerating the growth of the digital economy. E-commerce, which was expected to hit 88 billion, is now expected to hit 102 billion by 2025. What does this mean? This means that e-commerce in Southeast Asia has hit an inflection point. We are right now at the inflection point where e-commerce and the digital economy is just expected to grow like nobody's business, right? And if there's any time to actually participate in the digital economy or invest in the digital economy, this is the time to do so. Now, how does Malaysia fare in all of this? When I was having a short chat uh, below the stage, Dr. Michael Kang actually said, yeah, but how does Malaysia fare? Well, Malaysia has been growing in tandem with it. Uh, as I think Dato uh, Henry was saying, we're growing about 20% a year. But what's more important is that cross-border e-commerce and cross-border digital economy is expected to further accelerate over the next few years. So if you look at the digital economy as an industry, you cannot look at Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia. You have to look at the whole of ASEAN or the whole of Southeast Asia as one which means the opportunity is very large. However, competition in the economy that's growing at this pace is also very strong. And I think that's the biggest challenge. Malaysia has had a foothold, was in the driving seat, I would say, of all the countries in Southeast Asia. We had a chance and still have a chance to be the technology capital of Southeast Asia. The Digital Free Trade Zone was one initiative that I think put us at the forefront. Alibaba choosing Malaysia as the as their warehousing, uh, centralized warehousing facility to actually cater for the region, actually brought in a lot of other interests from other parties. However, that has slowed down a bit, at least in terms of perception, since the change of government. When the change of government happened, uh, PCOM did make a statement that we need to further accelerate the digital economy. We need more talent development, and unfortunately, that has 
We haven't seen that happen. The pace of getting talent to come in, because talent is the number one cost factor of the IT industry. Number two is actually property. Right? But talent is the number one cost factor. So if you have enough talent in this industry, the industry will grow because the overall market is growing. But if you do not have enough talent, then we're going to lose out to Indonesia, we're going to lose out to Thailand as well. So it's very key that we do not put our foot off the accelerator. We were in this position 20 years ago when Tun Dr. Mate started the MSC, but that slowed down. We need to make sure that doesn't happen again. So we really need the government to start focusing on real initiatives on talent development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ganesh. So we come to the last speaker. So please try to prepare your questions. I will say that uh, we try to give each of the speaker one questions in their subject matter. All right, uh, Niger, please. Thank you, Professor. Um, it's great being the last speaker because all the previous speakers have already touched on things that you would have touched on, so I can keep this really short and sweet. Um, as far as tourism is concerned, uh, we tend to divide it into two different areas, inbound and outbound. For the outbound outlook in the tourism sector, we do not see any decrease. Malaysians will still continue, continue to travel outwards, maybe more intra-ASEAN rather than to uh, further reaching destinations such as Europe and the United States, but they will continue to travel. The main, prob the main issue here is inbound travel. Uh, Malaysia is the uh, tourism in Malaysia is actually the second largest uh, foreign exchange generator. Uh, and uh, it is uh, very highly dependent on many, many other uh, industrial sectors as well, uh, predominantly those sectors that have to do with people movement. Now, some of the optimistic outlooks for the sector include, uh, but are not limited to these few items. Uh, RCL, for example, has come in Royal Caribbean uh, and has put in money in order to develop uh, Penang, Swettenham Pier, as uh, uh, one of the uh, to, uh, cruise hubs in Asia, given Malaysia's geographical position. Now, Penang is looking forward to this because they're expecting a huge influx of uh, tourists into the island. Uh, many of the airports in our countries are also being earmarked for development to increase capacity. There has been an increase of flights from uh, China, for example, uh, into Sabah. Uh, Korean markets are starting to expand inbound into Sabah as well. And a lot of this has to do not only with the infrastructure in the state, but a lot to do with the promotional efforts of each state in these various different markets. Uh, the Tourism Promotion Board, or Tourism Malaysia, uh, and the Ministry are also targeting to take Malaysia to more international trade shows, which is basically the lifeblood of the tourism industry. Uh, in 2020, we still have, I think, Visit Malaysia on the board, and this year, in uh, the largest travel trade show in the world in Berlin, Malaysia will be the featured or partner destination and the private sector as well as the government is gearing up for that particular event. Uh, another milestone in uh, the tourism sector, of course, is the 100 million matching grant. Uh, details have yet to be released, but we are told or we are made to understand that this matching grant has a lot more to do with uh, tourism promotion. So the private sector as well as uh, the related associations are all looking forward to the details which I think will be released in February. Uh, that being said, the challenges to the tourism uh, sector uh, basically have to do with A, people movement. So the sector is actually looking more towards the government uh, looking at um, increasing the capacity of uh, transportation in and out of the country, especially to do with air and, of course, uh, cruises. Uh, the difference between that is one plane carries about 200 over people on average per plane, but a cruise ship can carry 2,000 or more. Uh, so as you can see, that's a huge people mover in the industry. Uh, now, the onset of this would be benefits to the retail industry, of course, uh, and, of course, all the secondary industries that are related uh, to this uh, movement of people in and out of the country. Uh, number two, the challenge of technology. Uh, disruption has caused a lot of uh, pain in the marketplace. But the optimistic side of things is that uh, tourism players, be they hotels, transporters, or uh, travel agencies or operators, are beginning to realize the potential of going digital. And uh, we are beginning to see a lot more adoption of uh, digital technologies in the tourism sector. Uh, last but not least, the major challenge will be to legislation. 
the government actually has very old legislation which has yet to be changed since the early 1980s. Uh, so unless those uh, legislations, the act is modernized and regulations relaxed to a greater extent, uh, the tourism sector can look at uh, losing out competitively to our ASEAN neighbours. Uh, so that's the tourism outlook for uh, Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, I was informed by the organiser in view of time uh, we, we would not be taking any Q&A. Uh, you can send your q and online. But I'd just like to do my work as a moderator to sum up as quickly as possible in the speed of light. Uh, first of all, the ONG sector seems to be quite bullish, as per the speaker, because there is res rationalization in place. Uh, using technology to improve productivity has been able to ensure that they have got better productivity and profitability. On the e-commerce side, uh, I think the speaker shared that the statistics shows that there is a 20%, uh, we can go to a 2019 to a 24% growth. Uh, of course, the future trend is always about new wealth generation by the e-commerce. Uh, they feel that there is no cannibalization to the retail and traditional industry. Some of them are going back to retail. Uh, it is a platform that gives opportunity to new startup for uh, equal playground. Uh, of course, many are going into digitizing their products and services. On the SME, Dr. Michael Khan says that, yeah, they face great challenges. One of the most important things that he talks about is skilled labor. And I think he constantly talk about it and continue com complaining about the new government that I won't say anything because Datu Sri Anwar is coming in. Yep. So uh, it's going very slowly like a snail is saying. Yeah. The next per person, Datu Sri Gary, my friend, says that uh, well, he's still uh, quite pointed out the dynamics of the growth, although it's very sluggish, at only 2% and 4% growth, uh, likely 5% growth for the retailing in 2019. Uh, he feels that tourism is an important factor as a catalyst to ensure that this retail industry will survive, citing Bangkok as an example and how we have lost out. Uh, he feels that there's a big glut of shopping mall, uh, but nobody's doing anything about it. That's good. Uh, he shows example of interactive malls happening in other countries in China and so on. Uh, he thinks that the, trade, uh, the, uh, the currently uh, retail products that are sustainable are wellness and F&B. Uh, Siwa talks about very bad news, no good news ever since he spoke, and when he talk in his mood, you know, no good news, downturns, very bad things, like that for. But then, at the end of the day, he said there is still hope, and that's uh, because, uh, all right? So I don't know where, where is the hope, but it's okay, I picked that up. Uh, you can ask him questions, I'm not the speaker. All right, PICOM uh, IT is very uh, bullish, talking about by 2020, uh, reaching 200 billion US dollars of revenue, and uh, expected even to 240 billion US dollars. So he says it's time to invest in digital economy. I must be quite stupid. I just invested into retail industry. I should have met him earlier and I uh, started a wet decat outlet in Sabajaya. I hope I won't close down in the next couple of months. Uh, so he says that don't look at Malaysia as your market. You should look at ASEAN and Southeast Asia. Uh, the biggest challenge is again talent development in the IT industry. We don't have talents. Uh, Niger, the last speaker, talks about yeah, tourism is the second largest wealth generation. Uh, we need improvement in infrastructure, airports, Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, we need to increase capacity for the industry. Our crews and so on must be better. I could not hear much of what he said because of the echo, but nevertheless, I hear the last thing he says that we need to modernize the legal system, which is outdated, and I guess that is in every industry. All right, with that, I'd like to thank the speakers very much. If I add and edit what he said, sorry. Uh, I think the, those who are on the floor, feel free to email them and when you have time, uh, just go and look for them later. All right? And thank you very much. And uh, that's all.